Welcome to the Nautilus Book Award Spotlight in partnership with Nautilus, better books for a better world. We showcase winners in the 34 categories of green living and sustainability, mind, body, spirit practices, spirituality and religion, business and leadership, memoir, social change, poetry, women, and children and youth. These Nautilus Award winners now join the prestigious ranks of fellow authors such as His Holiness the Dalai Lama, Deepak Chopra, Greg Braden, and Peter Canova. Now, here is your host and fellow Nautilus Award-winning author, Kathleen O'Keefe Canavis. Book Awards Spotlight Show tonight. We have a great guest for you. Our author tonight is Peter Canova, and he is the author of the book Hope in Elisa. Welcome to the show, Peter Canova. Hi, Kathy. It's good to be with you today. Thank you. So glad you're here because I have so many questions for you about this amazing book. But one of my first ones is, can you tell us about the awards you won for this book? Yeah, the book won three Nautilus Awards, two silvers and one gold, in uh, two separate categories, uh, visionary fiction and inspirational fiction. Wow, that's amazing. So tell us about Pope and Elisa. Uh, what, what makes her tick? What is Pope and Elisa all about? Well, uh, really, on a large scale overview, you could say Pope and Elisa's story is our story. Um, it's a story about a, a fall, uh, a redemption, and uh, a reconnecting with um, the, the higher source from which we all derive. Uh, and that's really the story of uh, humanity because um, we came from somewhere else. Our spiritual selves came from another dimension and fell into this uh, material world. Uh, we're here in bodies, but we're... we're we have spirits incorporated inside of us, and we often wonder what what is it all about? Why are we here? Um, you know, how do we how do we get to this state? And the spiritual traditions and the religious traditions all tell us that we came from a higher state. So, Annalisa's story really was a saga uh, about somebody who grows really what you could say from the bottom of the barrel to um, really be in uh, a position where she was able to affect very positive change in the world. One of the things that I really, really love about this book, besides what's between the pages, is the cover itself. This cover of your book is is gorgeous. How did is this something that that you imagined and and then and then created? Yeah, the cover. Um, well, I collaborated, of course, with a graphic artist, but I, I pretty much had laid out most of the cover myself and she put the finishing touches on it. And uh, I really wanted the cover to convey um, a woman who was in the earth, but almost otherworldly, as you can sort of see from the, 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 the image of her face and the way she's looking upward. And of course, the background of the book is reflective of the background plot of the story, the, uh, the international terrorism and the intrigue and the clash of East versus West. Uh, and you really, you really can see that in this book. One of the things that I really love are the eyes that are looking out at you at the top of the book here, and and you know it's like you're you're you are riveted to this book the minute you see it. Um, so tell us what makes Pope and Elisa uh, different from all the other spiritual thrillers or religious thrillers that are on the market today. Well, I I think the depth that it goes into is uh, really explore our human origin and also um, the recovery in this book of a spiritual tradition that was lost to the Western world 2,000 years ago, because essentially that's what she does. She embodies a spiritual wisdom and a tradition that actually represented the very earliest uh, Judeo-Christian traditions before they were obscured by the hierarchies and, and priests and the um, in the case of Christianity when the Roman Empire got a hold of Christianity and altered so many things 
So she represents a more pure form of spiritual inspiration and knowledge that she's trying to restore to the world. And I think the depth in which the book covers that tradition and covers the the you know the spiritual core that was at the foundation of almost all the world's major religions and connected them together, which a lot of people don't know and don't understand about all these things, I think is what makes the book unique. So uh, what what kind of qualified you to, to write this book? Where where did you get your information from? It's really a combination of several different streams. Much of the information, honestly, was really kind of channeled. It, it sort of came to me in a way where I didn't really feel I was writing the book myself. I almost felt like I was a scribe that was taking down notes from information that was coming somewhere else. But much of it was just really long hardcore research over a period of decades because I've always been interested in spiritual matters. And when I had some very startling spiritual experiences myself, uh, I then started to study other fields to understand what is what is the basis for a person to have spiritual experiences. How do we have these things? Because I'm, I'm spiritual, but I'm also a Capricorn. So I, I have that kind of desire to understand the nuts and bolts of the mechanics of how things work. So after I had these experiences, not only was was I studying spirituality and you know the different spiritual traditions, but I also investigated quantum physics to understand what science was saying about all, all of these these things, uh, you know, relating to um, the way the world works, uh, the origin of the world, the origin of the material world, and what science knows about that. And lo and behold, I discovered amazing correlation between quantum physics. And the wisdom that was in these ancient spiritual texts, I, I can give you some examples of that later on, but it really startled me. And it really led me to believe that there is a truth out there and that we can discover that truth through different doors. We can discover it through spiritual or meditative means, or we can discover it through scientific means, through study of the natural world. So you were, you were talking about some personal experiences uh, with the spiritual world. Could, could you give us an example of that or, or share one of those with us? Well, you know, I, I kind of started off by startling myself many years ago in finding out that I was a medical intuitive. And I was able to very accurately diagnose uh, physical, emotional, or mental conditions just by having the name, uh, the age, and, and the location of any particular person. And once I had that, I was kind of able to zero in on them and get a lot of um, a lot of information out of that. Well, that startled me because I never had any antecedents to that. I never considered myself a psychic person per se, and it happened to me more in my twenties. It wasn't like something that you know I started developing naturally in my teens or something like that. So uh, after that, it kind of opened up the floodgate, and I, I just had all kinds of different experiences with uh, remote viewing. Uh, clear audience, clairvoyance, um, being, you know, having predictive type of uh, vision and so forth. So um, over a period of years, I began to understand that there's a whole other dimension out there that is parallel to ours. We don't see it, but we can sense it by extrasensory means, and that's where we get the term extrasensory perception. So I began to realize that there's parallel universes out there, and that from those parallel universes, we can derive a lot of uh, information about ourselves, our personal lives, and about the very nature of creation. So you were also uh, talking, and it's very evident in your book, you were talking about the ancient mysteries. Now, have you seen that kind of popping to the surface again during our modern times now? Oh, absolutely. For one thing, you, 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 um, in the Western world, you're seeing the resurgence of Gnosticism. And the Gnostics were um, actually um, a, not a religion, but they were uh, a spiritual orientation, a body of spiritual knowledge that actually um, was at the very foundation of early Judaism and Christianity. Gnosticism really, in a way, predated both of those religions but it was at the spiritual core and it was a system of spiritual knowledge that had been derived from generations of seers and mystics who went to the other side and brought back information about who we are, why we're here, where we're going, 
and what we need to do to get back to where we came from to a basically a higher state of being. And the spiritual wisdom I'm talking about permeated the early Christian church before the Roman Empire got a hold of it. And we ended up with modern day Catholic Christianity. So um, there was a um, discovery or several discoveries that took place in the desert sands of Egypt back in the 1940s. In 1945, the year the atomic bomb was unleashed, uh, they found the Gnostic Gospels did not come out of Egypt. Uh, shortly thereafter, they found the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, these documents are opening up a whole new window on what the original Christian message was, what the original teachings of Jesus and the disciples were. And it's really quite astonishing. Pope Annalisa herself represents a restoration of this earlier spiritual knowledge and spiritual traditions in an effort to reform modern-day Christianity and the Catholic Church. That's amazing. It's, it's almost like the past is catching up with the present, and they're moving into the future together. And isn't it amazing how when we're setting off the A-bomb, suddenly we find all of these really amazing uh, information from the past. I, so, I, don't, I don't think that was any coincidence either that the nope. ushering in of the nuclear age in 1945 was the same year that these secret gospels were found because the truth can be suppressed, but it can't be destroyed. It will all pop up in various ways. And indeed, that ancient spirituality, the way it survived, it kind of went underground, but it was still present in um, different in different ages with the uh, troubadours, the tarot, the Rosicrucians, the Freemasons, uh, all these groups who incorporated aspects of this spiritual mystery and uh, in these various sort of uh, secret society ways and, and codes and in the tarot card, the symbologies uh, that are embedded in the uh, tarot cards, uh, these were all expressions of that suppressed spiritual wisdom. But, you know, and so you were talking about quantum physics uh, before we, we got on to uh, talking about your, your story about uh, spirituality and uh uh, being able to uh, look at people and, and tell whether or not they're ill and what is wrong with them. Uh, so can you uh, tell us how quantum physics plays into your book? Well, it, 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 it's almost too numerous and too deep to describe in, in a few words. Um, but I, I'll, I'll give you an example, uh, a very, you know, what I think was a very startling example. Not long ago, I think a couple years ago in July, I remember it was in the summer, they announced that um, the particle collider, the giant particle collider, the, the Hadron Collider, that is uh, buried underground between Switzerland and France, uh, they discovered um, the God particle. Now, the, the God particle was uh, a, a particle that was, it was theoretical, it was theorized to exist. And it was supposed to be the key to convert energy into matter. So it has to do with the very much with the origin of the physical world, how, how energy, which is spiritual, because that spirit is energy, how energy becomes material, how it, how it materializes. So the God particle had a lot to do with that. And um, the story of the God particle is that um, when energy comes into our universe, and it's very interesting about energy because Science, scientists can harness energy to some extent. Um, they can understand the properties of energy to some extent, but they can't explain energy. They can't explain what it is. They don't know where it comes from. They don't even know how it exists. They can manipulate it. Um, but energy comes into our universe, and these these particles that, that are called Higgs bosons, which is popular the term the God particle, they, they surround this energy, and they slow it down. And when energy slows down, it essentially coagulates and it starts to become matter. Einstein's E equals MC squared has told us that, um, you know, matter and energy are intimately related and, and the matter is energy vibrating at a low state. So the God particle slows the energy down to a lower state and it converts into mass or matter. There's a very interesting story uh, in the Gnostic Gospels, the ancient secret Gospels, uh, about a feminine aspect of God that fell from a high energy state 
and went into what they call chaos, a place where it was engulfed by these particles, and these particles slowed down for high divine energy. And she cries out, I'm becoming as lead, I'm becoming as matter, save me, my light is being diminished. It's the exact same story about the operation of the God particle told in terms that the ancients could understand. They, they, they didn't have technical terms back in those days. They didn't have particle colliders, so they wouldn't be talking about Higgs boson. But this whole story of this feminine energy called Sophia uh, that was uh, lowered and became essentially became matter is an exact correlation to the God particle. So, Peter, what, what made you decide to choose a, a black African nun as the main character of your book? Where did that come from? Partially it came from the fact that I lived and worked in Africa uh, for a number of years. Uh, but a lot of it came from the fact that I wanted to show that God and spirit can express itself uh, in any form, in any way, even in the most um, unlikely circumstances. And the most unlikely circumstance that I could think of becoming a pope in a church that was pretty much run by old white European guys um, was uh, a little nun uh, from Africa. And uh, she uh, essentially kind of uh, outflanked everybody <laughs> and uh, rose to become the pope of the Catholic Church. I, it's kind of hard for people to believe that, but when you read the book, it's completely believable. The way the whole progression of her um, a life occurs in the book. Uh, it, it, it's very believable within the context of the book, how she becomes both. So, uh, you know, what I really found fascinating about the book is is the melding of uh, the Muslim religion and the Christian religion, and much of what's happening now is happening in your book. Did you find it difficult to write that uh, without having history pass you by with the book? Because you were trying to write the book into the near future, but did you find that history kept catching up with you? Oh, there, there was an article that was written in Times Magazine, um, and I, I believe you had something to, to do with bringing that to them even uh, some years ago, uh, and it was all about a number of geopolitical uh, predictions in the book that, uh, that came to pass. Uh, and today, lo and behold, we have a very Pope Annalisa-like figure in the papacy in the presence of uh, Pope Francis. He's not a female, but uh, the reforms and the way that he kind of uh, stirred the pot with the conservative elements in the church and um, a number of things that he's done were very much uh, in keeping with uh, the actions of Pope Annalisa. But there was also um, the uh, uh, Gulf War um, before, the book was actually written before the first Gulf War and it predicted the first Gulf War. Uh, and then the second Gulf War um, came along and. Uh, I finally, I decided, okay, I can't uh, make this book based in Iraq and a war with uh, America and Iraq. So I switched it to Iran and uh, I saw Iran going nuclear. And sure enough, <laughs> sure enough, uh, you know, before the book got to the press stands, Iran, we found out is secretly gone nuclear, going nuclear. So um, th these are just one of several um, things that uh, coincided with actual uh, physical events. And at that point, I said, you know what, I'm not changing the plot of the book again. Even if it looks a little dated, I, I'm going to go with it. But the fact of the matter is, it's still very current. That, that must have made you a little nuts to have to keep going back and rewriting yeah. that book because history was catching up to you. Well, you know, it, 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 the, the thing is that the way it developed, a lot of people would say, oh, you know, he's just kind of recounting present, present events. But it was really the other way around. The present events were catching up with the book. So what is the main message in your book that you want your readers to, to take away? Well, I, I think it's for people to understand that you are a human being, and as a human being, you are much more than what you believe yourself to be. We have tradition, Judeo-Christian tradition, that tells us that God created human beings out of the dust of the earth. We sinned and we got on, you know, his bad list and now we're forever running around trying to make up for that. And that's where the, the guilt of Judeo-Christianity comes in. But the spiritual wisdom in the book says that we have a much higher state. We are actually aspects of the divine itself projected into human form and that we 
as human beings are like the fingers of God touching the face of this world. And our purpose is that we can spiritualize the material, but we can also bring the experience of the material back to spirit. So it's really the merging of two dimensions that have been separated, that have fallen away from one another, the spiritual and the material. And this is a bridge. Annalisa is a bridge. And we as human beings are bridges because we are both material and we are spiritual. And that, in the book, is an exalted state, more exalted than the angels that never left the throne of God because they were never able to experience the school of hard knocks and go through the complete spectrum of existence from spirituality to materiality and then back to spirituality again. That's amazing. And, and I'm going to ask you a question that I'm sure um, a lot of people think, but maybe they, they, they might be afraid to ask it. How is your book different from, like, the Da Vinci Code? Do, do people ever think that maybe you took off, to you know, took ideas from that? I mean, I've read your book, and it's nothing like it. But well, how do you answer that question? Yeah, the funny thing is I met Dan Brown some years ago. Um, and um, I'd actually written Pope Annalisa before the Da Vinci Code, but because he was a, a, a published author, he, he kind of got his book, was able to get his book out of the gate a little bit quicker. Um, you know, the, uh, on a very superficial level, there are some similarities because um, Mary Magdalene, who played the role in Dan Brown's book, also plays a large role in Pope Annalisa. And, and incidentally, I should mention that Pope Annalisa is one book in a trilogy. It's the first book in a book called the First Souls Trilogy. And Mary Magdalene plays a prominent role in that. Um, and uh, of course, Dan Brown presents um, an alternative version of Christianity, but it has nothing to do with spirituality. His, his thesis in this book is the old bloodline theory, which is, you know, Jesus and Magdalene, you know, had children and so forth and so on, uh, which I, I felt that ma that makes Mary Magdalene a soccer mom. Uh, and it doesn't really... Um, point to the deep spiritual role that she had. And there's an intimate connection between Mary Magdalene and Pope Annalisa. And they're both essentially restoring uh, a spirituality, this feminine orientation. And what I mean by feminine orientation is it goes back to the days when all human beings were able to use intuition and imagination as gateways to make contact with higher dimensions. We've pretty much lost that ability in the last several thousand years because the world has gone over to such a patriarchal uh, type of existence, a patriarchal type of rule that uses logic and, and, uh, and analysis as opposed to spirituality and imagination. So they're restoring the feminine qualities that allow us to open up the gateways to other worlds and make astonishing discoveries. And I would say that even people like Albert Einstein use these feminine qualities because Einstein often envisioned through his imagination and his, his intuition, he envisioned the end result. And then he worked his way back into the scientific proofs. So maybe they're helping us all be Albert Einstein's. <laughs> maybe they are. I have to tell you, your book is so amazing that it would make a great, great movie. Is there, is there any uh, chance of that? Absolutely. We're, we've been in active discussions with a number of producers. Uh, and right now, I, I can't mention names. Uh, but um, we're, we're talking to some pretty big powerhouse producers right now about TV series. Uh, for Pope Annalisa, and we'll keep our fingers crossed. We'll see how it goes. It's a tough process out there in Hollywood. Uh, but uh, it, it, the book has gained a lot of traction in Hollywood. A lot of uh, high-level people have read it and have been sort of kicking, you know, kicking around the, the notion of uh, what to do with it. So, you know, if we uh, put it out to the universe there. Um, hopefully we'll see something on the screen someday. So where can our audience go to find your book? Well, if you can't find it physically in a bookstore, you can order it in, in, in any bookstore, or you can go online uh, to any of the big online sellers, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, uh, it's in various uh, versions of both um, uh, ebook and in uh, hardcover and paperback. And how can they uh, find out more about you? Uh, the best way uh, is to go to the website, popeanalisa.com. That's one word, popeanalisa. A N N A L I S A dot com. And I have another um, uh, website for my second book, which is just coming out now called the 13th Disciple dot com. Uh, oh, the 13th Disciple, the website is the 13th Disciple dot com, one word. Um, but uh, on both those websites, particularly on Pope Annalisa, uh, it gives a lot of my background, uh, gives a lot of, uh, has a lot of great articles 
uh, talking about some of the things that we touched on here, but we don't have to talk about uh, science and spirit, um, the history of, uh, of these um, ancient traditions. Uh, I think it's a fascinating website for a lot of people who are inquisitive uh, about um, alternate spirituality because it, to a large extent, Pope and Elisa and the First Souls Trilogy is really about spirit transcending religion. It, 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 it's about a, a, a spiritual knowledge that cuts across all racial, religious, class lines and so forth because it's universal. It shows our connection as human beings and our origins and that kind of obliterates a lot of the fences that we put up around ourselves. Well, Peter Canova, I want to thank you so much for being on the show with us today. And again, Pope Annalisa, winner of three Novelist Book Awards. Thank you so much for joining us on the Novelist Book Awards Spotlight. And uh, we hope you'll come back and win more awards with your other books. Well, uh, thank you for having me today. And I'd also like to thank uh, the Nautilus organization. You know, they're one of the premier book awards um, that you can get. And I was highly honored to uh, win these awards for them, from them. And uh, they, they're, uh, they're tough. Uh, they're great. Uh, uh, they have great judges over there. And um, they're really doing a service to um, uh, inspirational and 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 uh sustainable movement so uh, i want to thank everybody for that well thank you peter canova for being with us and all of our audience out there please join us next monday for another segment of the nautilus book awards spotlight thank you for being with us good night thank you for joining us on the nautilus book awards spotlight the show can be downloaded on the website catcannabisshow.com. The show will be posted on YouTube, nautilusbookawards.com, and you can learn more about your host and author, Kathleen O'Keefe Cannabis, at kathleenokeefecannabis.com.